Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to welcome you to this IOD Centre for Corporate Governance discussion on boardroom culture, the elephant in the room. Um, I'm really delighted that we're drilling down into this important topic today, particularly as for so long, um, it was neglected by many discussions on governance. People thought either it was too difficult a topic or perhaps too, too nebulous to get to grips with. I think the good news is that now we're much more aware of the importance of boardroom culture to the success of any board and board directors and chairs are trying to get to grips with it. Board performance evaluations are trying to assess it. And the whole discussion around boardroom diversity is really anchored in the need to create a more positive or more effect effective boardroom culture. Um, however, I suspect there's still a lot more to be done, um, and that's why I hope that this discussion will take us a few steps further forward, um, particularly in respect of how boardroom culture can help promote a genuinely stakeholder approach, actually, to, to governance and, and company uh, behaviour. To moderate this discussion, I'm really grateful to Katya Gorbatyuk from the London Stock Exchange Group. Uh, welcome, Katya. Um, Katya is also a member of the um, Centre's Working Group on Stakeholder Governance. So without any further ado, Katya, I'll, I'll hand over to you for the discussion. Thank you, Roger, and to the IOD and Black Sun for co-presenting this webinar. This has been a year of increasingly granular discussions on sustainability. And we hope not to disappoint you as we approach Christmas, as we're here to talk about something that can't necessarily be measured or assigned a KPI to. Uh, having realized as society that business cannot go on as usual, our eyes are now on corporations who have more power than governments to affect change, both positive and negative. Companies and their investors find themselves quite suddenly at gunpoint to demonstrate change in their corporate behavior. We're seeking for them to redefine success overnight, and that's a radical change for most, with a mountain of mind-bending uh, work ahead. What's an easy way out? To put on a, a mask of virtuousness and print a glowing sustainability report. And that's how this quest for sustainability can become a masquerade of virtue signaling. Quite a dangerous idea in a world still full of suffering and where our nature is being decimated. And equally unhelpful in this context, in the context of these issues, is a compliance-oriented box ticking of legal requirements. But this is exactly what will happen if we try to enforce change without addressing the DNA of corporate decision making, the mindset and the process of arriving at key strategic decisions. We're at the point when we desperately need capitalism to change its course, to use its power to be become a restorative force in our communities and on our planet. And that's why culture is the elephant in the room. This webinar will address, um, uh, will attempt to shine some light on the topic and our speakers today will do so from various angles. David Stiles, Director uh, of, of Corporate Governance and Stewardship of the FRC, will talk from the regulator's perspective. Dr. Margaret Casey Hayford, um, a member nominated non-executive director of the co-op group, chair of Shakespeare's Globe and chancellor of Coventry University, as well as former uh, company secretary and strategic legal advisor to join Lewis Partnership, will talk from a practitioner's perspective. Andy Griffiths, executive director of the Investor Forum, will talk more from the investor's perspective. And Joseph Murphy, employee non-executive director at Capita PLC, will talk from the stakeholder's perspective. A year ago, as part of our work for the IOD Center for Corporate Governance, my colleague Sally Pilot and I interviewed David Stiles of the FRC. We asked him about the challenges boards face in bringing the stakeholder into the decision making. And he said the word culture. He said that that's the area of focus for the regulator. So before I turn to David, this webinar will have three parts. 
uh, the first part will talk about what we're talking about and why. The second part is who are the people that can build a boardroom culture we need to take ESG beyond a compliance oriented activity. And three, the third part will be about some practical ways this critical leap can be accomplished. So David, uh, why would a regulator focus on something uh, so seemingly vague uh, that cannot be measured or quantified um, or directly regulated for that matter? Well, thank you um, very much indeed for that thought provoking uh, um, introduction and, and indeed question. Yeah, why would a regulator bother with culture? I mean, ultimately, this is about this is about behaviour. So, as you as you probably know, um, uh, my team and I are responsible for the UK Corporate Governance Code, and we're also responsible for for the for the um, Stewardship Code, which is an investor code. But as far as the, as the um, UK Corporate Governance co Code is concerned, or one of the one of the reasons it's there is to influence behaviours. It's to influence behaviour in in the boardroom. And inevitably, that is not simply knock-on effects. Inevitably, what, what the board does affects what the company does. The board is directing the company and the company behaves in a certain way. Um, so when you influence a board, you influence the company. And ultimately, what we're, um, another important part of the code is, is obviously getting companies to perform better. And, and within the boardroom, that means effective decision making. Um, and effective decision making comes through uh, a number of a number of features. It, it means understanding what the company does. It means reporting it effectively. It means having essentially, of course, having having the right people on the board, a diverse mix of, of, of people with a background and a range of skills and experiences uh, and knowledge to bring to bear on the decision making, engaging with 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 stakeholders, as, as I've said, uh, including the workforce and importantly shareholders, which of course is um, uh, I'm sure Andy Andy will mention late, later on, um, gathering that information, making good decisions and effectively uh, making the company perform better in the long run and all of the benefits that that brings for our, our markets, for our economy, for our society. Um, so that's that's why we're interested in it because it's at the, at the heart of uh, it's at the heart of good governance. It's at the heart of uh, good decision making. And I, I can't finish uh, answering this question by saying this comes at a very timely uh, moment because yesterday we published our update uh, to our, our culture report in 2016. Uh, creating positive culture and I'm sure I'll get a, a, a chance to mention the highlights of that later on. Thank you, David. And that's a perfect point to bringing Andy, uh, because, of course, the power of investor engagement could not be overestimated. And that's a further reason to keep companies in the public domain where investors can influence how issues get addressed. So looking at the investor forum stats, over half of collective engagements have been done at the board level. So how would you say uh, culture manifests itself during engagement? Well, thank you, Katia, David. Thank you also for those comments and um, good to be on the panel with everyone else. Um, so I, I'll probably just say what investors are really interested in value and value, you know, exhibits itself in many, many ways. But, you know, the profitability of a company, but then the multiple that attaches to that. And that multiple is a real function of the reputation of a company. And culture, of course, plays a huge part in how that reputation is earned and maintained. So I link those three building blocks together uh, when, I, when I think about why, why culture is, is so important. It's, it's the how you get there and it's how you can have confidence that, uh, that value can be maintained. And value isn't just the highest share price. Value, of course, has to be sustainable. So that means more and more shareholders have to think about how are the stakeholders being treated? You know, is this a product with... So this is a company with great products and services. Does it look after its customers? Well, how does it actually just take care of the environment it works in so that the value that is created is actually going to be sustainable? And we've obviously seen lots of examples where companies, you know, shoot for the moon for a period of time, are very highly valued, and then we experience really unfortunate consequences for, for, for everyone involved. So we need to find ways that this system becomes more robust and we don't sort of over borrow on future value and then 
uh, and then create you know these accidents that that, that lit to the corporate landscape. And culture is really important in that. And so therefore the investors are spending more and more time trying to find ways to assure themselves that uh, the right kind of conversations are happening. And then when they need to escalate something, that the board is available, um, they listen to the concerns, and then they can show some evidence of how they respond to those concerns. So that comes very much down to relationships. And, and, and that really is probably the, the key way in which culture is, is evidence. Can you uh, be assured of certain minimum standards, but then when you need to escalate something, how does the board show up? Um, and, and that's, I think, how investors look for, for evidence. And then I know Joseph will talk, but you know, the shape of that board, how it changes over time, the influences that it, that it chooses to take in are all signs of the culture that is, that is being maintained uh, and so that overarching feature has some very clear follow-ups that you can focus on. And of course, that's what investors do. They look for tangible evidence and they break culture down into you know, a series of components that can be assessed and then uh, brought together in that overall analysis. So yes, um, there are my initial comments. Yes, yes. And uh, in fact, you mentioned something very important. So my follow on question was, um, if, if investors engage in a particularly difficult situation when um, uh, the uh, confidence in the board is, is, is at stake, you know, isn't that the moment where the how the company is, responds is especially critical and this culture plays a particularly important role? Absolutely. I mean, you need to build relationships in good times. You don't only want to build relationships when um, either something's gone wrong or you need something, because um, that itself is indicative of kind of you know, how, you're, how, how, you, how you think about the, the shareholders and the stakeholders. Um, so the re that, that's really important that people are, are always available, but that investors, they're being asked to ask many, many questions, but You've got to figure out what's material, what merits the attention of the board at any given time, what can you have an influence on. Uh, so not everything can be taken to the board and engaged with directly. It has to be the things that are most crucial at any given time so that the board can work with that decision um, and, and actually try and do something uh, powerful. And the last part I would say about engagement, um, it's always much better to try and look for a solution than it is just to reiterate a problem. Um, and that's an important part for investors actually in their culture, <laughs> how they choose to engage if it is forward looking and in the interest of solving a problem rather than just sort of castigating a company for a, a known failure. It has a huge impact on how that engagement can go forward and how the company responds as well. So culture fits on both sides of, of any conversation. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Margaret, in your recent paper published by the Center, and I would like to ask the IOD to paste uh, the link into our chat, you draw a difference between two approaches to ESG, a compliance-focused approach and a proactive strategic approach. So firstly, what is culture of the boardroom to you and how does it influence uh, the nature of the company's relationships with stakeholders and how does it play uh, into the difference between these two approaches? Uh, you're muted, Margaret. <laughs> Someone was about to do it, sorry about that. Um, yes, I mean, it's such a big question. The culture of the company is, is, is in essence, it's its view of itself and the, and the way that that informs its, its strategy, the strategy to which it establishes its responsibility, um, not just for the, com com the company's own success, but its, its stakeholders um, and, and, and um, supports their interests and enables the company to have to build in a resilience as a consequence. And it, uh, so that it becomes clear to all who engage with it, how it will deal with issues, with difficulties, with risk management, and importantly, what values govern its relationship with the, all its stakeholders. And so in that respect, it's sort of the underpin to its policy setting and the way in which it creates a framework that allows management and the employees their freedom to um, uh, implement the policies. So probably the best thing to do is to give you a couple of just really quite stark examples. And um, it, I, I'm going to be sort of quite 
basic when I, I, I give these examples and I'll go back to the old fashioned idea of a company that company A determined to make the most money it can every way it possibly can. Its view of itself then means its financial return is more important than the stakeholders in spite of the fact that, that set, section 7172 in the Companies Act asked it to have regard to the wider stakeholder interests. It, it's, it's going to put the shareholders above um, all else. And in that scenario, we consider it, it considers it sufficient to comply with legislation and do no more because the risks that it sees for itself are essentially um, non-compliance with the legislation, not growing the bottom line um, and not meeting its targets so that um, it, it's, it's, it, it's essentially all about ensuring that the outturn is, is, is right financially and um, everything else is seen as an expense. Basic minimum compliance is absolutely fine. And it, the law doesn't really actually demand an enormous amount more than that. I mean, having regard to those interests can be quite a passing checklist tick box sort of way of dealing with things. Then we can take um, what is increasingly the preferred culture of company B to balance the interests of all its key stakeholders with those of the shareholders and to do more than merely comply with the legislation to enjoy a better relationship has just been described by David and Andy with, 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 uh, with the stakeholders. Company B is likely to consider the stakeholders as, as being not only those who can make you, but also those who can break you. And it's therefore complete folly not to listen to them and have regard to their interests and um, how they, how your decisions will impact upon them. And so it sees value not just in the commercial aspect of itself, its outturn, but also in the expression of its values and how um, they are managed to protect and preserve and promote its reputation. So it will make a statement of its values and that statement is public and will be something that it can be held accountable for. And essentially, when we look at the three buckets that I, I refer to in my paper of environment, social and governance, it's the way that it responds to each of those buckets um, and whether it puts those um, as primary or secondary to the financial return. So we've got the possibility of three different ways of dealing with that. So it has to make a decision, I mean, culturally, whether um, the way it's going to deal with ESG, environment, social and governance, um, is primarily appeasing <laughs> customers and, and investors um, and, and, and focusing on, the uh, on, on, on what it sees as the primary objective, the financial return, in which case that's what I would call the tick box method. Or secondly, whether it recognises um, that that the, the, the ESG, the um, environment, social and governance values is so, uh, are so important that they should sit alongside the return of the profit to the shareholders. Um, and um, that, that therefore changes the, the, the agenda and, and requires individuals who are going to champion the ESG agenda actually sitting around the board table. And then the third way is that you're not just leaving it at, the, at what happens at the board table, you're actually trying to make sure that those ESG values are embedded right through the organization. So, so that um, what um, th those, those who subscribe to um, number one would call the sort of the non-profit element, non-profit values, but I, I would say that there is a profit attached to those because essentially your whole reputation and, uh, hangs on the way in which you, you deal with those, your values have, a, have an asset value. Um, and so, so, the, so number three, the embedding within the whole organization means that everybody needs to understand the statement of the values um, and everybody can operate um, within that. Um, comfortably understanding that they're, that they're, the way they operate is going to impact on that value, that, that set of values. And I was fortunate enough to be the director of legal services of the John Lewis partnership, which was founded on those principles, even though it's, you know, hundred years ago, the founder um, espoused those principles and, and basically wrote into the constitution key principles that demanded 
um, that uh, essentially we ha should have regards to the employees, the customers, the suppliers, and the environment in a responsible way. And it, 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 it's great to see that that transition is actually uh, moving into the general mainstream. But I was really surprised when I first went to work at John Lewis Partnership, and I, I wondered whether it was um, sort of greenwash, if you like. And I found that the constitution actually stated that we worked for the happiness of the employees through running a successful business, um, encouraged the organization to tread lightly on the environment, treat suppliers fairly, treat customers fairly, and in so doing, give back to the community. And that because there was, that was actually enshrined in the, the, this really slim volume of principles, everybody worked to that. And it meant that the customer came in and felt comfortable in the environment and understood what the values were. You didn't have to have a big statement of it on the wall. People understood it was embedded within everything that was done. Um, and, and you can see that um, if we go back to the company A and company B scenario, and you imagine them to be two drinks manufacturers, that company A might decide that it produces its drinks um, consuming as much water as is necessary to do so, just abiding by the minimum legislative requirements in terms of product. Um, so that, for example, E numbers and so on would be to the level that would make it look good, calorific, calorifically. The sugar levels might be incredibly high. Um, sugar is addictive, so it means that the punters come back for more. And until government says, can you stop that? Because, you know, children are getting increasingly obese and dying early. That's where it leaves its, 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 its ambitions. Company B, on the other hand, is thinking about the employees, the health impacts of its product, whether there's slavery in the supply chain, whether it's consuming copious amounts of water. And we'll have due regard to that in terms of, for example, the way in which it might deal with some of the countries in which it trades so that it might wish to put, put back something to those countries if those countries are country, uh, have an, um, a, 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 a water infrastructure that is not optimal. Um, why? Because if water is an, is an increasingly scarce commodity, that could create conflicts around its own supply chain that make the product more expensive. So it has a long-term impact, that cultural um, uh, benefit, that cultural uh, uh, circumspection, um, that requires it to have people around the boardroom table who have a wider ambition for wider society. I mean, it's such a big subject, but I'll stop there for the time being. Margaret, and if we could bring it even to a more pragmatic orbit, is there a link between culture and the quality of financial and non-financial reporting? And uh, because we all know that uh, reporting drives transformative processes and ultimately uh, drive investor demand and cost of capital. So is there a link there? It's a really, really important link. I mean, if, if we go back to, um, uh, well, it's not all that, that long ago, um, reporting was essentially shareholder driven. So it was very much about um, focusing on how management was organizing itself to operate, to, to make sure the operation delivered well. So um, identifying risks, how did it do that? How's it managing those? And how are you getting the best returns for shareholder? How is the remuneration being organized so that it incentivizes the right outturns? And so management's not taking too much out of the business. That's not necessarily a bad thing, because um, you know, in the days when we saw government as the big deliverer of infrastructure and, and civic and environmental protections and education and health and so on, um, it, that was absolutely fine. But today people believe that gov government should be smaller and that we should do more for ourselves. And that in, in that context, who are the ourselves? Ourselves includes companies who are in law a legal person. So we're increasingly asking companies to play their part. And so in doing so, they need to report in such a way that we know that they're treating their staff well. We know that they're having a responsible relationship with their suppliers and to outsourcing. And, the, and as I say, that they're treading lightly on the environment um, and that the customers think that they're performing well in relation to them. So all of that requires um, data analysis, data assessment, um, making sure that um, the outturns are real and not performative in the way they're being dress, addressed. Um, so we, we 
it's it's really interesting to look at the way people are, are, are changing their reporting. We had a number of um, uh, peripheral reports, if you like, sustainability reports on the side during the early 2000s, and then gradually becoming more and more integrated. And in, in particular, I, I think Andrew probably have some comments about this because investors are now looking increasingly to see how management is, um, uh, is, is assessing its values because that's, that increasingly has a value. And I know that um, really responsible um, investors are actually asking themselves to, um, in the exercise of their fiduciary duty, to assess the way in which management um, is, 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 is actually um, um, uh, reporting on, on those, those, those values and the value-driven elements of, of, of their operation and are actually um, moving their portfolio so that they are gradually encouraging um, that um, be better reporting and in, in, indeed it's not just the better reporting of course the better behaviors as a consequence so that they the investors actually have an, an increasingly important role in this um, so there is a there is a gradual shift in in the way in which we report and and, and uh, um, we 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 are gradually I think seeing a better shift from the tick box but not enough as yet Thank you, Margaret. Before I turn over to Joseph, um, I saw David nodding. So uh, anything um, you would like to add here uh, on the reporting, of course, I'm sure that's a lot, but um, how culture drives um, the quality of reporting in your view? Well, if you've got a positive, um, uh, thank you. Yes, I did. I nodded it a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, culture uh, uh, and integrity are, are very strongly linked and uh, if you have integrity uh, in terms of um, decision making you have integrity in terms of how transparent you want to be about what the company uh, is doing uh, then inevitably that's going to improve reporting and when you have good quality authentic reporting it, it, that is a, a good lever for for the investors to become involved uh, to understand what is going on in the business and to and to ask ask the right questions. So it seems to me that there's a um, a direct link there. And one of the things that we well, uh, came up in the in the report that um, was produced yesterday was, of course, that uh, when it particularly when it comes to culture and being transparent about your culture, unless you've got um, you've set yourself an objective or a target at some way and you report on how you've met that target uh, and uh, it, it, on your open about that, then then we're back to, well, not exactly um, the greenwashing, but culture washing is a, it can be a problem as well. So, so you have to, um, uh, as I say, be um, have integrity in your decision making, uh, integrity in your actions and integrity in, t in terms of your reporting all of that as well. And though all of those things are, are clearly directly linked. Thank you, David. I um, would like to bring in uh, Joseph Murphy, who has been waiting patiently there, um, uh, and uh, particularly uh, from his perspective of, of, of a unique position of being an employee representative on the board, uh, because at the end of the day, corporate behavior is the sum of individual behavior starting from the very top. So, Joseph, uh, what's very unique about your role? Uh, what has been the effect of having an employee director? Yeah, thank you, Katya, and thanks to all the other panelists for your um, sort of very insightful comments so far. Yeah, so I'm I'm an employee director, and I'll explain a little bit about what that sort of specifically means. Uh, so I'm an employee that was chosen by the company's leadership to become a non-executive director um, on you know the PLC board of Capita. So I wasn't elected. And I have the same legal duties, obviously, as the other directors uh, to promote the success of the company for the benefit of its members as a whole. So not just one, you know, individual stakeholder group. So I, you could sort of summarize that in terms of my employee engagement uh, role as I'm there to provide my perspective as an employee. And 
I'll, I'll give a little bit of background as, as to sort of how this came about. So Caput itself is, is unique in having this role in, in the format that I've just described. And Capita, you know, was and is going through a transformation and it, it basically had new leadership who, who saw that an employee director was a unique lever uh, in, in affecting that transformation. So I think it was essentially a bold action um, to, to back up, you know, the equally bold words that they were, uh, you know, issuing. So in my perspective, I think it lent a lot of credibility to the board and to the management, um, which is extremely important in a transformation uh, where you're trying to you know, win hearts and minds of, of your stakeholders. So in terms of the effect, it, it challenges management and the board. And I think it tests, you know, really tests their attitude to employees. So, you know, how strongly do they advocate for employee engagement and empowerment, uh, you know, strongly enough to put an employee on the board, um, for example? Uh, you know, do they value um, diverse perspectives or are they more experienced biased where, you know, they want very, very experienced NEDs? Um, and I think, you know, any reporting you read recently has shown that stakeholder engagement and, and in particular employee engagement has improved a lot over the last few years, including the FRC's sort of recent uh, corporate reporting reviews. And all companies and boards are, are different. So, you know, this option, uh, it w won't suit everybody. Um, but I think it's, it's very interesting to note uh, that no other company has chosen um, the option of having an employee on the board. So there was a involvement and participation association uh, re uh, review issued this year, and they found that 40% of companies had um, chosen to, to use the option of an existing NED being the uh, workforce engagement option. So there's, there's three options in the corporate governance code. Um, and 0% had chosen the uh, put an employee on the board. And out of that, you know, basically capital was the only one. So I think that, you know, that stat sort of speaks for itself uh, and, 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 you know, generates a lot of questions, I think, for our companies. Um, now, I think, you know, the effects, essentially, one, one way of looking at this is, um, you know, talk to people who were there before I was there. So, for example, my chairman, and I've had sort of similar um, events where he's been asked and, you know, his, his, uh, one of his responses is that he, he feels it's like having blinkers removed, uh, you know, while he's performing his role. So he's much better informed. And I'd agree with that analogy. I think, um, you know, chairs and meds have to have a healthy skepticism about how rosy a picture is uh, is being painted, you know, by the management, um, and what the culture in the organisation really is like, and having an employee director sitting there in the in the meetings is is a is a sort of a way of ensuring that a balanced nature of the information, and it's also a sort of a immediate cultural probe on the organisation. You can get. You know, feedback and, and, and input. So um, I think they're they're the sort of big effects. Uh, you know, the credibility it lends the board, the um, the sort of balanced uh, nature of the information, and and the, uh, the sort of cultural feedback that you can that the board can get. Thank you, Joseph. Go ahead, Margaret. Thank you. Um, I I loved hearing what Joseph had to say because. Um, uh, I mentioned the John Lewis partnership earlier on, and um, I think many people know that it uh, is technically was was set up as a trust for the employees, and as a consequence, it, it did and does have um, employee directors on the board. Um, and when I joined the organisation as director of legal services and 
company secretary, I was interested to see how those individuals would um, hold their own, so to speak, uh, sitting at uh, um, a board table at which their in effect bosses were present. And it's a really interesting dynamic because it tells you a lot about the importance of stakeholder representation around a board and how um, other um, board members need to be suitably humble to listen properly and to allow them and, um, and enable them to feel sufficiently supported that they will bring their views to the boardroom because it, it would the whole experiment if you if, if I can term it that Joseph without it sounding yeah. perhaps yeah. um, would collapse if um, if if there wasn't suitable respect of those yeah. individuals as 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 directors and, and, I, and it says a lot for um, capture I'm really impressed and I, I think that um, diversity around the boardroom table is 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 generally um, requires that 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 sort of um, humility from the others it, it, because you know the first woman to be on the board the first ethnic minority to be on the board um is similarly going to feel um a slight nervousness about um their, their position and 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 the 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 way in which they can represent the, the interest um is going to be emboldened by the way in which they're supported and listened to by the others. So I was really, really excited to hear what you had to say. Thank you for that. And I oh, share that you. completely. Um, and um, as we're looking into this, uh, the future and a potentially new way for um, the boardroom to be shaped, I think it's important to take a look at the uh, past 50 years because, of course, corporate practices were a mirror reflection of the way boardrooms functioned and uh, what the definition of corporate success was. So I would like to, uh, perhaps Andy, um, uh, if you could uh, kind of give your perspective as to what corporate practices um, uh, in, in over the past 50 years, how they were linked to the kind of boardrooms we had, who were the board members, what were their motivations to be a board member, uh, what competencies or, or backgrounds were sought when, when new board members were recruited, and um, um, perhaps what needs to change. You're muted, Andy. <laughs> Gosh, well, a lot is changing, uh, and that's good. I mean, if you use your 50-year time horizon, it was very much chairmen were, well, they may even have been chief executives at that stage. They may have been, you know, the same role. Um, so I think really perhaps 20 years ago, um, work by David and others to really embed that separation of the roles was, was really important. Um, and that then opens up the opportunity to have, different people and different perspectives even if the very first cadre were all just you know formally chief executives of large companies becoming chairman of other large companies and often chairing two or three so um whilst the first step was the separation of duties then uh, you know the the gene pool didn't expand very dramatically for quite some time <clears throat> but at least the roles became came different um and then I think we've been able to tune the system quite a lot by finding gradually, I mean, a lot of people say the progress has been way too slow, but you know, a number of initiatives mean that you have a much wider range of skills as chairs. Still very often people that have got very clear company experience. But I mean, it's even interesting that often in the FTSE, a lot of the really well-regarded chairman were quite often CFOs not CEOs it's quite interesting to just even that slight shift you know, you've got a lot of experience of delivery but um, from a slightly different vantage point even that um, introduced some new elements and I think the codes and the and the messages and signals from investors um, are beginning to show people that they just need to think much more broadly about you know how those roles can be filled but also how that they they can conduct them and and but Joseph's point is is just excellent. I mean, it's it's a real shame that only one company really of of, of the larger companies is you know, can use that evidence to say, look, you know, we've gone this way. Every company has to do what it feels feels right, but we still need more evidence, if you like, that change is is coming and this 
how this broader range of interests are being represented that companies still don't really do enough to do that to evidence what it is they're trying to focus on and, and how they're trying to conduct themselves that, that's that's important that they do more of that and then decisions like the one that capital made become more natural they become it's you, you should expect to see it happen rather than um wonder why one company did it did it different so i think that's in summary the frameworks change the people are changing but you've got to equip people to be successful on boards and margaret's point is is really crucial you, you can't have people walking into environments in which they're going to fail because they're either not welcome or you know the range of skills is broader but then they've not been um the the company hasn't thought enough about how the conversation needs to happen so that everyone can can contribute um and there's not much, there's not that much evidence or, or material that you can look at to see how companies you know really can prepare for that broader perspective so that their directors succeed because that's what everyone wants you don't want to see um uh, boards boards fail because the way they embrace change is is, is either too fast or is reactive rather than a function of you know their, their real values Thank you, Andy, and thank you for bringing in this uh, important point of uh, separation of duties, because, um, of course, initially it was done in the name of financial uh, kind of financial uh, outcomes. But today um, uh, there is a, a need to have a genuine and genuinely challenging discussion on, on broader issues. So maybe I can bring in David to give his perspective on, of, of uh, what's changing, who, who used to be in the boardroom and who needs to be there now, what's changing there um, well it is changing i think uh, has been acknowledged by many on the panel and um, it still needs to change more and and of course what we've had over the past 50 years um until more recently has been too much uh, recruiting in uh, in your own image um and unfortunately the image looks looks rather like me but um so we need to recruit outside outside of that uh, that image and um, I, someone mentioned the phrase gene pool, and that's really, really important because you need, uh, as suggested in the, in the principle to the UK Corporate Governance Code, uh, you need um, ethnic diversity, you need gender diversity, you need a range of cognitive and personal skills, uh, and you need socioeconomic background, uh, background as well. And a lot of progress has been made on on. Uh, gender diversity, still some way to go, very limited progress on um, ethnic background diversity, um, although targets have been set for that through the through the Parker review. Uh, and some out there will be aware of the work which the Corporation of, of London is doing, um, supported by the Treasury, particularly in, um, although it's the Corporation of London, it's a, it's a UK-wide initiative um, about social um, and economic uh, background diversity uh, in uh, the finance and um, um, ser service sectors, um, and you know that's that's an area which has been uh, well not exactly ignored, but hasn't been given the focus that it that it should have been. So it's a question of your of 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 the, the conundrum of uh, attempting to get experience uh, uh, and yet there are so many people out there with the right aptitude and the right skills who don't necessarily have the right experience or perhaps the background and what's, what's sometimes known as the fit and polish uh, to deliver. Um, I'll say something else about this as well which this is something which came out through our annual review of corporate governance reporting um, which was two or three weeks ago. And that is that succession planning is really, really important because what you're trying to do is have a, a diverse uh, pool of talented candidates uh, within the company, making their way up through the company to the senior levels. And one of the things that the code suggests is that uh, you should be obviously looking at the board, but you need to be looking at uh, senior management, two layers below the board and possibly further and you need to be creating that environment where you're developing that diverse pool of talent in order to you know deliver the excellence deliver the excellence that we want and we were a little bit disappointed in um, some of the reporting around there you know 
the, the code's very flexible. Uh, the code recognizes that companies are different, different sectors, uh, different stages of development, uh, all, all, all sorts of things. So, so companies are going to approach this in a different way. But, but sometimes it's useful to set yourself targets and objectives on these matters. But we weren't really finding whether targets have been set, objectives have been set, whether the, and if those objectives have been met uh, or not, and if they hadn't been met, what the company was going to do about it. So again, we're back to sort of reporting and integrity there. Uh, and that's something that um, we need to shine a light on. I would like to bring in an additional element. It, it has to do with the motivations to become a board member in the first place, because is it, it, is it a, a crown on one's career or is it linked to one's human aspirations uh, to, to really make a difference in more ways than one? So maybe, Margaret, if you could comment on that and, and, and what's really needed to change the DNA of, uh, um, of the boardroom. Um, okay, so first of all, I suppose there's nothing wrong with it being a, a, a crown. <laughs> um, um, but... Um, but one of the problems with uh, seeing it in that way is that we, we go back to the same old, same old, um, and we need to be quite careful about, uh, um, uh, as, as David says, bringing on people who've got capability but not necessarily experience. Um, and um, what, is, what is really important here is to think about the fact that um, if, we, if you want a wider outlook, if you want people to um, bring in um, the, the, the wide range of perspectives that uh, um, the, your, the key areas of your operation should be looking at, you're going to have to think about um, uh, an, an, a novel group of people. Um, because inevitably, for example, um, women will be probably be um, uh, uh, um, looking at issues from a different perspective and be possibly less risk averse according to the stats than men and and um in fact it's it's interesting to see some numbers of the reports that came out of the uh, uh, um, after the investigations after the 2008 crash um when boards were heavily criticized for um being too uh, male and driving um to the cliff edge because that was seen as a faster route to the economic outturn um, where women might have said, you know, watch out, watch out. So um, creating a, a listening environment um, and, and bringing in um, a, a diverse range is really critical. But that can um, go to younger people on boards, because, for example, if, if after the 2008 um, crash, we had looked at not just saving the... Uh, the money makers. We had looked at how what the systemic how, how the systemic issues could have been re revisited so that um, we change the environment to, for example, build in um, earlier strategic thinking about net carbon reduction innovations. I, I'm pretty certain that the way that young people think would have got us thinking in that in that way sooner. Um, than you know, just a few months ago, because of the imperatives of COP twenty six. Um, so, changing the DNA requires changing um, the individuals who literally sit around the table. But it, it also means um, looking at externalities. Um, so, um, you know, we've heard Andy talking about the importance of investors, and I think that the way that investors deploy their portfolio obviously can influence um, it can influence change. The codes of conduct that David's been talking about, um, and 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 the legislative requirements influence change. But um, whereas the codes of conduct and and legislation are sort of behind the curve, um, the 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 investors can raise the bar because what they can look at is the social benefits to their um, beneficiaries um, and they can they can make sure that environment social and cor corporate governance issues um, which impact on the performance of their investment portfolios um, actually be, be, uh, are, are used in the way they assess the company's success and the asset classes that they 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 go into so um, I think those external elements are really critical, but but the, probably um, 
the way in which investors help competitors to meet similar standards is really important here because I referred at the head of the conversation to company A and company B. Company B will always have a more expensive operation to run because it's taking into consideration the, the values driven elements. The only way that they can remain competitive in the market is if their competitors are held to similarly high standards. So by the investors demonstrating that they see the value in those values being held, upheld in the way they invest in their, the portfolios, they're actually raising the standards the whole time for, for the competitors and that's enormously useful. Um, so, I mean, I, I, and that is really critical because I can remember years ago talking to an oil company that was involved in Nigeria. And, you know, if you look at the, the fishing industry in Nigeria, it's been destroyed by the impact, the adverse impact of the um, extracting operations that were carried out. And at the time I was chair of um, ActionAid UK. So we had a, a, a very strong voice for these types of communities. And it was really interesting because the oil companies basically said, we hear what you say, but on the world scale, we're relatively small by comparison to some of the um, Central European oil extractors and oil and gas extractors. And unless you can get the competitors to meet the same standards, we will be just run out of business. And then you'll have you know, an even worse um, relationship between extractors and the communities and I, I, that that that, that um, certainly resonated with me so I'm I was really pleased to see that for example um, there are um, transition tools that are employed by um, some uh, companies some investors and I know that for example um, uh, I think it's Lloyds Bank has what they call a transition pathway initiative mm -hmm. which they use to assess um, um, companies by comparison to each other how, how are you managing your change what are you taking into consideration are you taking into consideration for example the, not just the way in which you move forward but the way in which you sit vis-a-vis -vis the, um, um, uh, the the UNS um, sustainable development goals or the Paris Accord the way your country wants to um, uh, um, implement the Paris Accord so, so that they're actually setting companies in a wider context and looking at the transition against that backdrop. And I think that if that's happening across the board, those externalities will really help to change the DNA of the company and to make the company more responsive and more responsible. So a lot sits with the financiers, the, the funders, um, and, 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 and um, the way in which they, they pick up on this, this, the social signals that are coming through. And so it's for all of us to say, you know, I don't want my pension over there, or I, uh, that's, um, and, and, and I feel very strongly about this. And, and, and this voice is very, very strong because we could see that with the Mercedes and um, Kingspan debacle that happened just over the last week, where Mercedes went into a relationship with Kingspan. There was a huge hue and cry, and um, uh, the, the, the people who lived in Grenfell Tower said essentially, you've gone after a sponsorship because you want you know, the financial benefit, but what about um, people like us who are living in these towers that were impacted on by um, Kingspan and whether or not Kingspan's product was actually used is, 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 is a matter for um, another, another discussion. I mean, the point is that there clearly hadn't been someone around the Mercedes boardroom table who had the wider community stakeholder interests in mind when they were thinking about that decision. And they went into the relationship with Kingspan, not recognizing the fact that the public wants to see a, um, a responsible attitude to um, the way in which we, we impact the wider community. And the public's reaction was such that literally within a week, the relationship has, has had to be um, uh, dismantled. So um, yes, the externalities, I think, really changed the, the, or helping to change the DNA. 
Thank you, Mar Margaret. And um, in that context, the, um, the whole uh, creation of the concept of stakeholder governance is a, a very helpful one uh, because it extends the mandate of boards. And especially it's so helpful when, it, when the words come from the regulator. So maybe uh, as we move into kind of the more practical uh, section of this webinar as to how do you change the fabric of decision making, maybe David, if you could uh, comment on um, how does one find a balance in decision making and reaching the alignment of values across the boardroom and reaching the, the balance uh, because um, uh, at, at some points there will be a conflict between stakeholder motivated decisions and uh, the objectives of um, investors. So how do you approach these dilemmas? Um. Well, yeah, there are dilemmas. So, we, you first of all, you approach uh, approach them by not denying that they <laughs> they exist because they're because they're certainly there. And um, Margaret has already mentioned uh, Section One Seven Two of the Companies Act and the list of matters which directors have to take into account. And not always will those uh, matters that you're taking into account lead you in the same direction. They might lead you in di in different directions, but the job of the board in a un in in a, in a in a framework where we have a a, a unitary board um, reinforces the need of everything that we've been talking about today about diversity in its wisest sense and uh, using that diversity well and also having the right evidence as well. I mean, we've talked about integrity a lot, but of course, there's integrity in 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 where you get your information from and uh, and how you use that information and how you use that use that evidence so the board itself drawn from a wide gene pool <laughs> has a has a uh, um, uh, evidence which it can can rely on and it has to act collectively and it has to think about what the ultimate decision is what is the best for the company and of course I think the first of one of those uh, the factors in section 172 is uh, um, around the nature of decision making for the long for the long term uh, now those list that list is not uh, a prioritized list um, just have to mention that so but but the long term is what you take into account and of course you know there are definitions around around this you're not you you are wishing to make a decision uh, which takes all of those factors into account and it also, when we talk about long-termism sustainability, sustainability, doesn't compromise your position now in order to take decisions in the future, uh, which will uh, benefit the company as a whole. Uh, and um, so not just the investors, but but, but future, in, future investors uh, and the benefits that that brings to the economy and wider, wider stakeholders. So it's a question of having the right people. It's a question of having having the right evidence. It's a question of having, uh, and I'm sure we'll come on to this in, in a second, uh, a very good um, a, a good chair who is able to, uh, uh, you know, it's, to, to collect the people and collect the data and, 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 and make sure that that decision is, is made well. And uh, I thought um, uh, what Margaret said was interesting about uh, there's not, um, uh, it's not so bad having having aiming for a crown and wearing a crown necessarily. I think it's how you wear, but it's also how you wear that crown uh, and, what, and what you do when you when when you've got it. And that means um, making sure that, um, as the code says, there's no one individual or group of individuals who's dominating decision making, uh, but but the decisions are come to in the, in the right way. Uh, so right, uh, uh, David, and uh, uh, talking about having the right people around the table, there is a question from um, in the chat from Roger. Um, he's, um, uh, th the question is um, that a corporate lawyer would argue that the members of the company are purely its shareholders. So do you perceive any conflict between representing the interests of employees and shareholders who you owe your legal duty to. So how do you address that? Um, well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give a, a go and answer that because I think he was, it, it came out of some of my comments. Um, I, I, would, I would say the legal you know, definition has changed. I, I'm not trying to, to redefine that. Um, I'm, I'm sort of talking about the, 
when I'm talking about not an employee director not having a preference for anybody else, uh, any particular stakeholder group, um, I'm I'm sort of talking about the fact that an employee director, in, in the situation that I'm in, because there's other formats, but in the situation that I'm in, can't come in and, and prioritize one. Basically, I'm saying somebody like me has to act in line with, you know, the legislation. Um, so, and, 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 and then the question is, does that create conflicts? Yes, it does. David just pointed out, this is the whole point. There is a conflict of interests between various uh, stakeholders and the board's job is to manage that, not to hide it. It's also to report it um, and, and to show how they have managed it. So, you know, they, they have a requirement to act fairly um, and, and to take into, a, into consideration the various stakeholders. So uh, I think there is conflicts and I think, um, you know, it, it's, that's the role of the board to, to try and uh, come up with the best solution. Margaret? Thank you, yes. Um, I think that um, th th this has been debated for, 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 for an, an awful, awfully lo long time. Um, and being part of an employee-owned enterprise, I was very aware of this dichotomy. Um, and I think that the definition that some people have used, which is probably most helpful, is the enlightened, enlightened shareholder value. Um, so in other words, if it, 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 it was a, the perspective that even if you're working in the interests of the members, they should be enlightened um, shareholders so that they would be the members who would expect you to have the wider view, expect you to um, think about the, um, the, 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 the long term and the impact of um, um, your decisions on the, uh, the suppliers um the, the wider community and the environment um and how that might um motivate your thinking um, within the boardroom um and, and so and so militate towards a better outturn so from that perspective i think that it helps to it helps corporate lawyers get over the the difficulty because it's it's suggesting that the um that the, that the members have an understanding of the need for that balance of, of, of their own interests with the stakeholders' interests. Thanks, Margaret. And uh, perhaps from Andy's perspective, when it comes to engagement, of course, um, investors, they uh, coalesce around the issues important to them. But then um, how, does, um, how do you see the responses from the boardroom? Um, uh, how are they changing in light of uh, the need to consider the wider interests of stakeholders? Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, one of the important things, just um, walking into that question from the previous comments, um, you know, the company model is just a fantastic model for balancing competing interests. Now, when you get it wrong, you see, you know, um, do you see the failures? But equally, it is a system that is set up to promote the success of the company. And promoting the success of the company requires you to find ways to balance those competing objectives. We talk a lot about stakeholders, but when you see stakeholder action in, in, in real life, very often it is a single issue campaign about one dimension um, so that stakeholder isn't thinking about the other stakeholders right they are 100 percent campaigning naming and shaming about the thing that matters to them and it's a lot like opposition politics all you've got to do is discredit the person in the seat of power as opposed to actually come up with a solution to a problem so what a lot of the ngo campaigning has done stakeholder perspectives has really raised the importance of issues but then there's a really important question about how you then solve that problem. Can the company be trusted to be part of the solution? Can the investors be trusted to take into account these complex issues and, you know, actually um, use their position of influence wisely or not? These are very, very difficult questions. We're doing a piece of work, which we spent the whole year on with LBS, trying to look at that academic insights into what stakeholder is 
and then the practitioner insights from investors as to how the two models compare because it isn't you, you can't really have an either or model you you know we set things up always in life seemingly that once one school of thought is right or the other is is wrong actually there's an awful lot within the shareholder and the investor model that if correctly focused uh and that means very clear mandates very clear objectives very long-term time frames does actually kind of bring the two models much closer than you might you know automatically consider but we need to be really thoughtful about how how this is, is going to work and how we use that company model effectively as opposed to just throwing out shareholder value because it it, it we've got to, you know it's, it's it's that's a really powerful organizing principle um that we need to find out how to use well and and john Kay, uh, i remember listening to him a couple of years so well I used to think that companies were just, you know, maximizing value, whatever that meant. And he said, but I didn't really start talking to companies for the first 60 years of my life. I was too busy being an academic. But then I realized that actually all that companies were doing were um, navigating from a series of short term instable, unstable equilibrium. So to balance these competing forces for any given period of time is a huge challenge. But these forces are moving so quickly that to move from one state of relative sort of stability to another in itself is a huge feat. So just recognizing how you react to those changing forces is really important. And, and the Kingspan example that Margaret used, I mean, if you actually go back as well to when the um, Grenfell Quarry evidence came out, the other thing that was revealed was um some really challenging questions for the culture of that company um a lot of emails came out showing you know this drive for um sales at any cost and uh questioning the veracity of some of the the, the testing that was done so it's really interesting once you shine your light onto a company which by the way investors have supported and it's and share prices are very high and all the rest of it and it plays an incredibly important part in climate solutions still the culture of that company was um, opened up through through an inquiry process so there's, there's got a, a lot of dimensions to this that here's a company that's a really huge part of how we're going to meet our climate objectives and yet um, an inquiry can raise huge questions about some of the culture that exists within that business so they're just examples of how you know you, you, it, 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 these are not binary decisions you've got to find a company focused on the right things they've still got to interrogate the methods that are used uh, in order to kind of give you confidence that business is being done uh, in, 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 the, in the right way. Um, so just, just a few reflections on the things that, that I'd, I'd, I'd heard. And it's really important that, you know, when you think about what investors can and can't do, we, we should be very realistic about that. I mean, investors have not really been very good on pay and they've not been particularly good on audit. They've been pretty good on diversity and climate in relatively short periods of time, but it, different problems need different solutions and how they're applied. Um, and what we must strive for is that the investor company relationship is strategic, not transactional. Um, the more transactional it gets, the, the less effective it, it, it can often be. So a lot of the pay conversations really actually um, are quite damaging to the relationships between the companies and the investors because they're quite quite transactional and they just have to agree to disagree most of the time they don't actually progress the the issue or, or really address the concern very effectively they restrain pay but they don't actually the underlying tension that's created is quite is quite high um so i just leave you a few thoughts there about how what, what good might look like you've got to be really clear in aligning you know, like, like the old Ron Seal test, does it do what it says on the tin? You've got to ask that at every stage. Is the investor mandate clear? Is the investment management activity clear? Is the company behaviour clear as a result of that? And if you can follow that through with the clarity, um, it's surprising how much overlap there is between the models. Absolutely. In, and in that context, is it's even more critical that um, our visionary regulator is approaching this not as a 
uh, code compliance exercise, but is looking at the outcomes and, and behaviors and the outcomes and behaviors, not just tied to the financial outcomes, but uh, broader outcomes that are um, uh, impacting um, uh, various stakeholder groups. So recognizing that and uh, how does, you know, if I could ask David, of course, it's not only about uh, culture in the boardroom, it's how that culture then impacts the, the entire organization. And in that sense, how do you see uh, your role um, in, in redefining uh, the, what success means uh, into the area of how corporations can make a broader impact in the society? Because there is a lot of, um, uh, there is a lot of mending to be done on many fronts. Yes, that's right. And, um, you know, the recent report that I've, I've just referred to talks about, um, you know, we, we, we're still we're still uh, experiencing this this pandemic and um, uh, it, it's caused a lot of suffering. But but we have to think about um, what we can learn from it and and the positive things that can can come out of it. Uh, and in particular, with re regards to culture, you know, I think companies have had to rethink and reorganizing uh, the relationship with the, with, with the workforce. Uh, and so it's absolutely clear that you've got to have leadership from from the top and the right kind of leadership. But it's also clear that the uh, that, that when you have a healthy and positive culture, uh, and that of course includes uh, proper policies and indeed practices, where we've got to work in practice, uh, proper speak up uh, and whistleblowing whistleblowing policies. But but also the general good quality engagement with the workforce, which feeds in uh, the, the workforce have got to feel involved and that their um, uh, any input that they put in is taking on board and considered considered properly. Um, and again, there's a bit of a gap there in the in, in sense of the reporting that we're looking for. Um, Clearly, we're interested in the processes and practice of what companies companies do, um, but we're also interested in that feedback loop, which we're not quite understanding yet. That feedback loop between uh, the the messages that go into the boardroom, how they're considered, and uh, how the board take account of them and make decisions as well. So back to transparency again, and 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 back to that that feedback loop that's extremely important. Uh, David, there is a really good question. I think um, you would be b um, uh, well placed to answer it. Um, uh, a challenge, I'm reading it, a challenge is that today, as a matter of law, directors' duties are very clearly set out in the statute and their duties are owed to the company's members. What's um, yep. uh, the panel's view on the likelihood of this fundamental principle changing to equalize stakeholder interests uh, in a world where societal interests feel like they're moving away Way from the shareholder primacy model with the heightened expectations of, of the societal model that companies should now play. Um, so, David, if, if you okay, could so take I'll, a I'll, I'll try not to duck. I'll try not to duck that question from 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 Ben. Um, I, I, and I can't say that this is an FRC view at all. I, Probably more a personal view, informed from 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 what I get. Um, so try not to duck the question. I I don't see uh, the law changing soon soon on this, um, but a number of other things might change. And the way I've been trying to frame this in the conversations that I've had more, more recently is that is the realization that the G the if, with the E and the S and the G that we've been talking about. The G has been there for a long, long time. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's the essentials of, of, of the G for governance, uh, audit and risk and remuneration and strategy and, and, and all of those key, those key things that, uh, that, that, are, that are important. But it's getting, it, it's become realized. It may have been uh, not as evident as it is now, but it's certainly more evident now that you can't do the G properly without doing the E and the S properly as well. Uh, I, I think that's one 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 way of looking at it. So, uh, to, so, so to answer Ben's question directly, I don't think the law will change, but I think that the greater expectations in terms of uh, consistency and transparency of reporting without trying to make that too burdensome, because I think there's a lot of reporting that's, that, that um, uh, 
so when it comes to reporting, the reporting has to be has to be accurate and it has to be material, and we need to focus on on that sort of, that, those issues. I don't see to use the sort of accountants or technical phrase. I don't see the um, us wanting to internalize the externalities by using company law as approach to do that. But I do see the pressures coming from um, other sorts of uh, uh, laws and, uh, and regulations on companies in order to bring about uh, change within company behavior uh, um, through wh whether it's through consumer or employment or, um, or competition or what, all those laws and regulations that impinge upon companies from elsewhere uh, could be used to 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 arrive at a at a more stakeholder focus. Margaret, you wanted to jump in. Go ahead. I was just, I was just going to say that um, the Better Business Initiative has been striving to get change to Section One Seventy Two to make um, to, to so that it imposes a, a clear um, duty um, on directors uh, to, to um, promote the, the interests of, of stakeholders and in other words to raise them to the, to the same level as the interests of shareholders and um, I, I, whereas I think it's a great initiative and I'm very supportive of, 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 of the ambition um, I think that unless one can persuade government that there is um, a, a competitive benefit to GB PLC or UK PLC um, on the world stage. I can't see that changing, and I, and I think that therein lies the problem. It's a, it's the, it's the issue that I, I, I um, alluded to earlier on when I talked about the, um, the extracting industries um, operating in Nigeria. I think that it, it's, it, it's a, it's a really difficult ask. Um, for one country to create a, 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 a really massive cultural shift. But what is good is that um, companies recognize their responsibility, their societal responsibility, but also that um, uh, the public, the consumer, the suppliers all have much louder coordinated voices now. And so not engaging with the wider stakeholders is, is actually folly and um, not having a wider statement of your your values um, is, is actually um, uh, really frowned upon. Em young employees won't stay in a company that demonstrates it hasn't got the right values. It, it was really interesting that after the death of George Floyd, young people kept saying to the companies within which they work, what is it you're going to do? How are you going to demonstrate that you're anti-racist? To be non-racist is not enough. And so companies um, were generally coerced into actually making a statement and then having made a statement that said these are our values, then having to move forward and, and, and positively demonstrate what they were doing to implement those values and to monitor change and, and to make progress in that dimension, which is way ahead of um, any legislative requirement. So um, I think that it's going to be less likely um, to be a, 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 a legislative shift than the cultural shift. Um, but given that all directors have the same duty to work in the interests of the organization, if you have a diverse board and that diverse board has individuals with um, different perspectives that they champion. I'm not saying they're axis to grind because um, the point was very well made earlier on that that's not what we're asking for. Um, it, it, if you want to sensibly run organization, um, you want people who can stand independently, leave the detail to management and then and just and ask the right questions. But they all have the same duty. So it means that their duty is not just a duty to in, um, to the success of the company financially, but to its wider longer term interests, which therefore should mean balancing the areas that are all championed around that board. If the chair has enough um, uh, determination to make sure that the materiality is driving the agenda. So in other words, you're not trying to boil the ocean by 
you know, bringing on, on board stakeholders of, with, with, with far too many interests and um, you're focused on things that are key to the operation, you will be asking yourself the right questions and you will be moving forward in the right direction, even though the legislative backdrop isn't there. Um, and I, I, I really understand and sympathise with Ben's, uh, the, the, the essence of Ben's question, but I'm afraid I think that the answer is not very likely, but it doesn't matter. And uh, considering the nature of the decision making, uh, very much forward looking long term, um, and of course the young people are a major stakeholder, um, a major uh, um, group of um, uh, population to be impacted by the decisions of today. So um, there is a relevant question about that, um, about age diversity in the boardroom. Um, where is it going, Margaret, since you, you started addressing it? And then I'll go to Joseph and the others on that. It, it is moving to incorporate young people, but far too slowly. And I think that that uh, there needs to be a boldness. There needs to be a boldness on the part of uh, chairs and nominations committees to say to uh, search agents, um, let's let's go for people who have capability over experience, um, because frankly, um, the old experience, which was focused on um, the, the the G. Um, is 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 too narrow and and is in fact it's not just too narrow but it's also um it's easy that's a bit that's easy to learn and if you if you um if, if you have a, a sensible corporate support there should be that ability to get all of your um your your your, your directors up to the right level to ask the, the right questions to set the strategy in the right way um and 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 as long as they've got the capability, they they should be able to land that. And we did. I I tried that on a trustee board, which admittedly is not a corporate board, a, a company board. Um, although there was the charity did have a, a company arm, so they did have to be aware of the company requirements. But um, we had two individuals under the age of twenty five. Um, we deliberately chose two so that the one individual didn't feel um, unduly intimidated um, by the oldies around the table. And it helped enormously that we de-jargonized to make the, the individual feel more comfortable. Um, and we um, made sure that board papers were written with the degree of clarity that they might not otherwise have been. And, and um, one could assume historic knowledge, for, for example. Frankly, it actually made for better um, discussion and, and it, it, it helped um, clarify thinking because things were simplified very often, um, not to a point of, uh, um, of it being a, um, creating a sort of nursery environment, but just uh, it was the de-jargonizing that was really important um, to just help helping um, at, at, uh, the, 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 uh, the discussion and the debate. But also we, we double mentored, so in other words, a young mentor um, uh, and uh, um, a, a, a young mentor was also a mentee and vice versa, um, which was enormously helpful. And I learned very quickly from one of my um, uh, new appointment appointees that um, I actually allowed the men around the table to speak for longer than the women. And I hadn't realized that I did that. Um, and so it was really just interesting that even in process alone, I just, I had, I, I learned something from having a young mentee. So um, it, 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 it helps the, 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 the cultural shift to think slightly out of the box when it comes to thinking about uh, who you're engaging around the table. And as I say, capability is, is really critical and particularly if they bring other skills like digital um, uh, uh, knowledge um, that, that might otherwise be lacking. Thanks, Margaret. Um, Joseph? Yeah, um, well, you know, age is a protected characteristic. So I think that, you know, as diversity evolves, uh, sometimes older diversity issues can get forgotten. Um, and, you know, it's usually considered the other way around. You, you don't discriminate against older people, but, you know, what about discrimination against younger people? Um, but I think one way around this is to for boards to look at, um, rather than looking at age, look at skill sets that they need and they miss. And I think what they may find is that a skill they need may be more prevalent in younger candidates. And therefore, you're not trying to find a younger person. You're trying to find a better suited uh, 
person to fill that gap that you have. Just on, on another point, um, you know, we, we, there's this debate about um, stakeholder, um, you know, uh, engagement and, and, and governance. And, and I think basically the big fear is, will that increase costs, reduce profitability? And I think a lot of people basically think that that's a, a sort of a given. Um, I think if we're, if we're being honest about sustainability and long-term prospects of a company, we have to really remember that we need a, pro a company to be profitable long term to to exist, you know, in 20, 30, 50, whatever number of years. Uh, so profit is has to be a huge part of it. Otherwise, the company won't exist. And then the other point about sort of cost is the these costs of these sort of areas we're discussing are almost irrelevant compared to the real value generators of productivity, innovation, and efficiency. That's what's really going to drive long-term growth profitability. And, and, and the costs of this will be minor in comparison. Andy, how, how do you think that that um, uh, age diversity, how would it play into the board uh, board's um, uh, kind of uh, response uh, as part of um, engagement in, and uh, particularly um, as far as its ability to, um, to address the issues because experience here is uh, quite paramount. So that's why I want to play the devil's advocate and um, would, would, uh, uh, what would the investors say? Um, I think most investors feel the recruitment process is, in, is opaque. Uh, is dominated by a handful of search agencies, lacks imagination. Um, and I think that's really important. So we, we've been involved in a number of situations where people have felt it was necessary to write to the board to say, we think you need a candidate with these capabilities because they weren't confident that the internal process or the advice that they were taking was going to result in not the a given individual but a you know those those prime considerations being taken into account and that just shocks me that year after year we see examples where the group think around the board table is is so completely different from what the external perspective might might be and i, I don't really understand why that continues but you do still see a number of those uh, situations um, so uh, you know, it's that process is just nowhere near. Um, well, applying to be a non-executive director is is not like applying for any other job, right? And I wonder why that is, because the other jobs are quite effective processes, right? Competition kind of works. Indeed, Katya, can, um, can I just challenge you on one thing that you've just said? Because um, the the question about experience over capability isn't something that is relevant only to young people. Um, and in fact, if, if we always go for experience, m many women would never get onto boards. Um, ethnic minorities would never get onto boards. And so you would still be fishing in the same pool that you have ever fished in. And so we have to be bold and we have to say, and pick up on Joseph's point, which I think is absolutely the right one, that what you're doing is you're carrying out a skills audit and you're saying what's right for our future strategy. Um, and our future strategy has regard to these particular key areas of stakeholder um, uh, 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 impact. And therefore the skills that we're looking for are these. And as a consequence of that, we just want the best people that we can find. And so it's about- Sorry, I think I, I think I was saying that. I, I was saying, I was saying absolutely that. Yes, indeed. So I, Joseph, I'm saying I'm agreeing with you. Absolutely. Yeah. What I, I sorry, I was just disagreeing with Katya. <laughs> uh, and I wasn't, and I wasn't saying anything opposite. I was, in fact, making a point. If somebody were, was to challenge that position, and if somebody was to approach this um, the, the vacancy only as a set of skills as a CV, without kind of like looking at the bigger contribution one can make, and without looking at the balance um, of skills, of backgrounds, of you know perspectives, we are looking for perspectives because you know our old perspectives have led us exactly to the point where we are today. 
And that's why, you know, if someone, if someone was to challenge that from the perspective of the experience, what would, you know, what would uh, um, uh, Andy say? That was the question. <laughs> So before I wrap up, just a couple of uh, practical advice from each one of you would be help, uh, helpful for the, for the audience. Very practical recommendations in that area. David. Thank you very much, Katya. I have posted my practical recommendation. I've posted the uh, FRC's latest culture of report uh, onto the chat. My practical suggestion is that you look at that in particular. Um, um, for, for, for practical suggestions, look at pages four and five because the way that the report is structured, um, it, it looks at opportunities and enablers, and it also looks at challenges and barriers as well. So it's trying to balance it out, saying these are things that are going to help you, these are things that might get in your way, and how you how you overcome them. Um, have a look at that report. Thank you, Margaret. Practical advice um, from the perspective of the um individual i would say you want your values to be in alignment with the company's values um so therefore look very much for the value statement you want your skills to be deployed so that you can champion specific areas that you know best and that you that that that, that readily um enable you to monitor and advise in a, in a constructive way um your personal responsibility and integrity are desired as david said right at the front end um if you're a chair, um, be bold on the materiality point, because I think that one of the difficulties with ESG is the range and width um, could put you in a situation in which the company is trying to boil the ocean. And if you are to protect and preserve the interests of the company, you need to look at what is absolutely key and what's material. Um, and um, from the perspective of all of the directors, effective listening humility um to listen and 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 support mutual support as a consequence um particularly if if the company is enlightened enough to have um employee uh, um directors um uh, yes listening to hear i think and 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 and, and balance thank you margaret joseph and andy Sure. Uh, yeah, just briefly, I'd say, you know, don't, if you're, if you're a med, if you're a director, if you're, you know, influential, don't, don't be afraid of enhanced employee engagement, you know, see it as the opportunity that it is. Um, and also don't see the sort of wider area of stakeholder governance as a cost, um, you know, challenge the company to, to innovate, to create the real value that, you know, they are supposed to create. Thank you, Joseph. Andy? I just think for companies that, you know, real focus on purpose, your objectives and the priorities that are behind that, those conversations will cause you to address all these issues that the rest of the panel have been sort of talking about. So it's really, um, I think, I think that clarity of purpose. And then I think the slightly two other observations are, you know, we're in a world where you really just need to provide evidence that you are true to your purpose or true to your values. Um, and that evidence is just more and more important. It's not, can't be taken for granted. And certainly if you've got opaque processes, that that's going to hinder or people are going to be suspicious of your, um, your agenda. And, and the last part is sort of where I started. You know, it's uh, solutions. We can't afford to have like, static analysis. You've got to be, business is very, very dynamic. It's much easier to change if you're looking for solutions. So you know, change um, creates virtuous circles. And, and that's really, really important. Keeping that beat of change will allow you to make progress. If you sort of become static and, and moribund by trying to address lots of different interests, you know, you lose, you lose that dynamic of progress. So I think it's really looking for answers, whatever stakeholder group you're looking for. And that's incumbent on both parties. That's incumbent on the company, but also on the stakeholders engaging in the conversation that you're looking to promote the best interests of the company. 
Thank you, Andy. And I would like to close with my favorite quote, um, what is essential is invisible to the eye. And in fact, culture might be invisible to the eye, but if we expect capitalism to play a different role in society, one that's not destructive and uh, one where which doesn't see people as a human resource but one that's restorative then we need a different thinking within businesses a different prism of decision making and uh, rules and regulations will not be enough to face that challenge and therefore addressing culture the dna of the organization is not just a nice add-on but a business imperative it's a driver of the long-term value and that rec recalibration requires a a truly genuine effort driven by, driven by a diverse group of people for whom it's not just a job but a personal mission, one that is connected to their human aspirations. So very, very grateful to today's speakers, truly devoted individuals who have addressed this topic from um, different angles. And it is our hope that discussions like these will serve as points of departure in building better and more fit for, pur for purpose boards concerned with a better future for us all. Thank you again for our audiences, for Black, to Black Sun and to the Institute of Directors for hosting all of us.